Thank you for joining us and welcome to the webinar. My name is Mia Colson and I'm with the National Association of Regional Councils. If you should have any technical questions during the webinar, you can call me or email me directly. My information is on the bottom of the screen currently showing. Today's webinar is funded by the Department of Energy's Sunshot Solar Outreach Partnership and will focus on regional collaborative procurement. I'll start today's webinar with a brief overview of the partnership, as well as share some helpful resources at the end of the presentation. But first, I'd like to introduce our presenters. We have Blaine Collison. He is the director of the US EPA Green Power Partnership. Jeff King, the principal environmental planner at the Metropolitan Washington Council of Government in DC. And Tyler Espinoza, project manager at Optimi. Blaine, Jeff, and Tyler, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. For those who have not participated in an ARC webinar before, the format will be a presentation followed by a question and answer session from our attendees. If you have a question during the presentation, please either raise your hand or type a question in the questions box in your control panel. And we'll be saving all questions until after the presentations are finished. Please note that we will also make a PDF available at the end of the presentation that will be sent out. So with that, let's get started. The Sunshot Solar Outreach Partnership is a U.S. Department of Energy program designed to increase the use and integration of solar energy in communities across the United States through outreach, education, partnerships, and technical assistance. The partners include NARC, the International City and County Management Association, ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, along with the American Planning Association, the Interstate Renewable Energy Council, North Carolina Solar Center, Meister Consultants Group, and the Solar Electric Power Association. And so with that, I will turn it over to Blaine Collison. Excellent. Thank you, Mia, uh, and th thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, uh, coming into the into the conversation today. Uh, so, uh, uh, what I want to do here is is talk about the collaborative solar procurement project that we've been uh, helping to facilitate here in the uh, national capital region in and around Washington D.C. Next slide, please. Um, uh, and you know, I, <laughs> I I will say that that uh, I've I've been at EPA for. Uh, 16 years now, um, aside from not being quite sure how that happened, uh, this has been on the very short list of, of the most interesting and rewarding things uh, I've, I've had a chance to, uh, to engage on in that time. So the, the quick commercial on the EPA Green Power Partnership, right, this is, this is the, the set of four primary things that we do. Uh, we, we help establish and, and maintain some national benchmarks for green power uh, eligibility, what resources count, uh, uh, usage benchmarks. Uh, we help help our partners with some planning and implementation. We're a recognition program. Uh, come come check out our top partner list. They're actually a really, really interesting capture of, um, of who has staked out a leadership position in the U.S. voluntary green power markets. And then we have a, a best practices and innovation silo, and that's really where, where this fits. Uh, next slide. So uh, uh, with well, the, the one other piece of context I'll, I'll offer is this. We, we've, we're up to about 1,340 partners that span all shapes and sizes of the U.S. economy, right, from, from the Fortune 1 to the Walmart uh, uh, across the, the publicly owned for-profit, non-profit sectors. We have 100 and some odd institutions of higher education in the program, 140. 40 local governments, local and regional government entities, feds, uh, uh, big businesses, small entrepreneurial startups, and everything in between. Together, those those 1,300 and some odd partners are using 23 and a half billion kilowatt hours of, of green power every year. Of that 23 and a half billion kilowatt hours of green power, about 5% comes comes from on-site system deployment. And the, the rest is is utility scale, um, and and one of the things that we hear on a on a recurring basis uh, uh, from our partners, and, and maybe especially from from our local government partners and, and maybe even higher ed, uh, is is an ongoing and strongly stated interest in on site and increasing their their on site portfolios, uh, and and so what we've done here. 
uh, is is convene a project um, using a model that that, uh, that Tyler will talk about at, at some length and and in full credit where credit is due uh, we we launched this project because we we got wind of the Silicon Valley project and the collaborative model that, that they developed out there, uh, Optini and, and a, a series of, of public stakeholders in the Valley. Uh, and in talking with, uh, with Optini uh, about that, it, it seemed like, like such, a, such an insightful and effective solution um, that the long story short is that we, we asked them to come to DC and talk with us some more. Uh, and then we asked them to help us convene a similar project here, right? And, uh, what, what we are talking about here is a is a mechanism that, that really addresses some of the the market barriers that, that our partners and stakeholders face uh, and that has the potential to truly change the scale uh, of, of solar implementation here um, in the um, in the public sector across the US economy uh, and, and to change the scale uh, uh, not simply in terms of, of what gets put in the ground but to change the economics in a way that's that's incredibly compelling so um, using that Silicon Valley model, uh, we engaged a series of, of uh, public sector partners here in the DC region. Uh, took a look at ultimately just close to just under 200 sites at 20 different organizations around the region, and it, it's we'll get into this a little bit. Uh, uh, the DC region, as many of you know, is is not one monolithic entity, right? We have two states and a uh, federal zone here, um, and Maryland and D.C. are actually fairly similar in terms of, of energy policy and renewable energy policy uh, and, and utility markets, and then Virginia is, um, is different uh, in, in ways that are determinative. Uh, we, um, we have taken those 170 sites and, and uh, moved through a process that, that leads us on the, on the cusp of implementation. Uh, to the tune of, of almost 20 megawatts of capacity across four different organizations uh, uh, and are busy now um, doing the, the final work to, to get that out into the market um, the process being uh, being driven by WMATA which is the Washington uh, the Metropolitan Area Transit Authority our, our, our subway and bus provider uh, next slide please uh, and we're also focusing of course on on documenting what's happening here and, and uh, sharing some successes so a quick look at sort of the, the schematic of, of, of the engagement, uh, and this is, it, it's, the, the slide is actually very reflective, right, and that, that we have, have uh, so e EPA and, and the Mo Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments there uh, acting as, as, uh, as conveners, and I, I, I cannot uh, thank Jeff King and, and the COG enough for the assistance and expertise and collaboration uh, they have provided we, we could not have done this without them and similarly uh, we have we could not have done this without without Optini and I, my, my apologies then that where that slide says EPA contractor it, it should say Optini uh, we uh, uh, we brought Optini on on board to the uh, to the team here as a as a paid consultant to EPA uh, to help us convene and, and manage this process um, and so so under the broad umbrella of, of uh, EPA uh, and opting the cog walking into a into a set of rooms with uh, with regional government entities and saying, "Hey, have have, have we got a great idea? Uh, can we can we talk to you about it?" Uh, what we what we have had emerge here is is a working group within the, with with Lamada having having taken a leadership position, uh, and then almost 20 other entities uh, participating to varying degrees. Uh, all taking a look at, at solar potential uh, across their portfolios. Uh, and as we head toward, toward phase one imp implementation here, uh, we've, we've got the private sector and the solar supply side uh, to watching what's happening uh, in parallel and, and getting ready to meet us here at the, um, at the RFP and implementation phase. Uh, and we've also got the, the regional utilities, and it's been particularly true in, in Virginia, whereas I noted things can, are, the market is a little bit different, uh, but, but evolving in some ways that are pretty interesting, uh, sitting up and saying, well, hey, uh, you know, actually what, what you guys are doing uh, you know, really might dovetail very compellingly with some things that we're working on, and, and can we talk about this? And, and it, it looks like actually there, there may be maybe potential to do a lot more than we thought based in part on what you guys are helping bring to market. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, it's, 
what, what I want to particularly focus on here in, in my remaining couple of minutes uh, is, is the set of challenges that, that we see over and over for our stakeholders when it comes to doing on-site and, and solar in particular uh, and, and why we found this model to be such an effective way of, of addressing that. Uh, and so you know, first and foremost, uh, right, so solar continues to require some, some expertise. Um, uh, and one of the things that we hear time and time again, and actually from our, our private sector partners as well, um, is you know, energy managers and sustainability managers and environmental staff are, are pretty well maxed out doing their, their core job functions. Uh, and and I, I was having, sitting in a, in a guy's office uh, with a, a major corporation uh, uh, a few weeks ago and uh, where, where money is almost no object. Um, and he, one of his competitors is actually across the street and, and he was complaining that, that they're doing a little bit of solar and, and his organization is 100% wind powered and, and you know, the guys doing solar were getting what he thought was disproportionate recognition and, and you know, couldn't they do it too? And so we looked out his window and they've got beautiful, beautiful, beautiful south-facing parking lots, all kinds of opportunity. Um, and you know, I mean, look, let's let's talk about about what you've got out your window here. Um, and you know, the, there's I think a no sh no small list of vendors that would be happy to talk with you about this and show you what's possible. And he said, yeah, you know, in fact, they they call me. I get a solar call once every couple of weeks, and and the person on the other end of the line consistently says, "Hey, this is going to be so easy. I've got a I've got a deal for you. This is going to be great. We can do this." And and my 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 client essentially said, you know, I, I don't I don't know enough to know what they're what they're queuing up to offer me and I don't know how to compare it. Um, which takes us into this other bullet, which is that while while third party financing and, and the advent of PPAs have been a game changer, uh, we we still have a situation where uh, for public sector entities especially who have no tax appetite, no tax benefit appetite because they're tax exempt. That may not be an optimal fit, right? They they may need some some special considerations or some different considerations. Um, PPA pricing uh, may may build in some some risk mitigation for the vendor. Uh, and come come back and, and poke at that in a little more detail just for a minute here. Um, and and we're in a situation here which we see a lot uh, uh, here at EPA in talking to our our partners, where where the solar conversation is being triggered by by a vendor phone call who's saying, you know, I, well, I've got something for you, company, um, but it's coming from the vendor perspective, right? And the, the starting point is, is the vendor has a solution that works for them, and it looks like it can probably fit for the company or companies, but, but we're not starting with the company's needs or the school system's needs, right? Rather than starting with an assessment there of, of the municipal uh, municipalities set of, of, of sites, their portfolio of opportunity, and then going in and bringing the industry in uh, to, to talk about that and address that, um, uh, our clients are in a position of reacting to what the vendors think is, is the right thing to do. Uh, and there's some risk aversion here, right, that, that, that continues to show up. And we've actually seen some, some really interesting solar opportunities um, uh, paused, significantly paused. Uh, because staff remains concerned about getting caught short out in front, right? Things sound too good to be true, and costs matter, and no one no one wants to be the guy that made the the big solar mistake. Um, uh, so ne next slide, please. Uh, and so so bringing this model to bear, we can see on the left side of the slides we've carried carried that set of issues through. Uh, so so. We've actually had a really interesting experience of, of I think, changing the conversation, I mean, literally changing the conversation about solar here in the DC region with this set of stakeholders uh, by, by bringing the collaborative procurement model to bear that, that Tyler's going to talk about. Um, and so the, the conversation has, has very much shifted from, yeah, you know, I've got a proposal on my desk from somebody. I didn't ask for it. I've got to figure it out. I'll get to it. As soon as I have a free half day, which will be you know four months from now or ten months after the the end of time, um, uh, and instead uh, the the conversation has been, hey, look, school system, uh, we've got some expertise queued up uh, to help you figure out. How, we're all going to help f figure out collaboratively 
what the true scale of your opportunity might be, and we're going to put it with with the opportunities from some other stakeholders, from your your colleague stakeholders across the region, um, uh, and, and we're going to take a comprehensive and careful look at it from your perspective and 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 from the perspective of what matters to you. Um, uh, and what we need is just a little bit of data. We're not going to ask you, energy manager, to become a solar expert. We've got the solar expert. We're going to ask you to tell us about your facilities, where, in fact, you are the reigning expert. No one else has that information, right? So we're we're shifting a little bit of the the work uh, into into core expertise and and bringing in the value added expertise where that's needed. Uh, and the customers get to define the opportunity, right? So it it's it's become a question of here's our portfolio. Um, what can the industry do for us? Uh, which is a much more palatable conversation uh, for everybody on on the the um, the uh, demand side of the equation. Um, and Tyler will talk about this also. And I, I hope I'm not taking too much of, of Tyler's thunder away here. Um, standardizing procurement terms and and arranging procurement terms to benefit the the end use customer, and then risk reduction. I mean, and, and uh, Tyler will talk about this also. That part of what What's most important that's happening here is that we are scoping out the the very specific uh, physical, financial, and technical opportunities before anybody issues an RFP, right? So so that that um, the school system or the city or the solid waste authority knows exactly what they have to send out for RFP. They know what their good solar sites are and what the potential is likely to be there. Um, and so the industry knows exactly what it's bidding on, and they know that there has been a highly qualified solar expert out there looking at the engineering and the interconnect uh, and the other technical considerations. So they're not bidding on on someone else's mistake, right? So so everyone is able to actually bring their their best pricing uh, uh, possibilities to bear on the on the opportunities. Next slide, please. And I'm I'm headed for the uh, home stretch here. So, so a quick look at, at who is engaged, uh, and and for those of you with some familiarity with the with the DC region, you'll know that this this doesn't begin to capture the the full range of of, uh, of stakeholders. I mean, one of, one of the reasons we we're interested in doing this here is because given the presence of the federal government and the Department of Defense and a lot of of upwards of, of fifteen institutions of higher education, the Maryland. Uh, localities and counties and state facilities, the District of Columbia uh, and and Northern Virginia local governments. There's there's an awful lot of public sector opportunity here. Um, these are the the entities that um, that engaged uh, initially with us. Next slide, please. Um, uh, and and we as I said earlier, we went we went from an initial uh, intake process of almost 200 sites uh, to do some uh, op did a just a, a tremendous job uh, executing some some early triage uh, based on their expertise, right? So some some low cost preliminary triage to exclude sites that were obvious outliers uh, for reasons of shading or roof replacement or uh, lack of interconnection uh, or a pending construction project, right? Uh, to, to doing a, a much more detailed set of, of economic and and uh, technical studies on on a smaller set of sites. Leaving us with with this current group that we're getting ready to bring out to market, and one of the things I would like to point out here um, uh, is that as we as we go from 75 sites to 36 sites, uh, part of the calculation that's that's Im embedded there is these these sites. This, this 36 emerges from the 75 based on the current set of economic conditions, right? Based on current energy prices, current solar prices, current construction prices, current current. Uh, uh, incentive schedules, these are what work. But that list, that, that remainder list stays in place. And, and as soon as uh, solar economics change again, right, as panel prices or, or inverter prices come down another increment, or incentives change, or uh, fossil standard offer prices go up a little bit, the, the inclusion line changes and and so so part of what we have here for our clients is is a built-in subsequent round of, of uh, additional PV deployment uh, so waiting waiting for the market to, to catch up to the opportunity next slide please um, uh, and so the, the timeline uh, 
Sure, we can say, say right, we jumped, we jumped one, but that's, that's fine. So what we're looking at here, uh, almost 20, uh, you can see this sort of the, the basic timeline. EPA funded some of the front end here. We're moving into, a, into the um, participant funded steps where we're getting ready to issue some RFPs and we'll do the, the normal implementation. Next slide, please. I want to be, be careful with, uh, with everybody else's time. Uh, the, the thing that I would, that I would want to point out a couple, just, just two things here. Um, Almost 15 megawatts of new solar capacity um, uh, comes comes to market. If if only 80 percent of these projects that we flagged go forward, right? So that's the the total current historical installed PV capacity in the greater metropolitan Washington region is somewhere on the order of five to six megawatts. Uh, so we're talking about a very significant total uh, uh, capacity increase in one integrated move, which we think will drive almost $60 million in local economic activity. Um, the, the return on investment here is staggering. Um, there, there are some front end costs, right? And, and as Tyler talks about, about the, the work that happened on the front end, um, that there is a cost associated with that. It is not $60 million. The, the, the initial investment is incredibly low and that, that economic leveraging is massive. Next slide, please. Uh, and I, I believe that I am I am just about done, but I I, I wanted to call this out and, and in some ways I, I probably could have used this one slide as my presentation. Uh, this is from an email I got from from one of our phase one participants, uh, and and I, I thought it captured the um, the the benefits of the project just beautifully. Right, it this this collaborative procurement model and the process that we've engaged in with with MW Cog. Its members and Optini have cha has changed the solar discussion here in the region. Right? It has literally become more manageable and focused. And, and my, my closing thought is that that uh, Jeff King has has given us two or three different opportunities to speak to the to the COG members. And at, at the last one, uh, back in January, we were we were providing us final update and and okay, we've gone through this triage and evaluation process, and we're getting ready to. to move this phase one implementation process. And when we got to the Q&A, we put up that list of, of uh, participating organizations. When we got to the Q&A, the first 10 or 15 questions were from, from organizations saying, well, wait, I don't, I don't see my name on there. Did, did you call us? Did, did, did we get a chance to, to do this? And the answer was, yes, we called all of you at least a couple of times. Uh, and and we, we would love to engage with you on a, on a second round. Um, uh, but it, it was it was really really interesting to see how enthusiastic everybody was, and once once they saw saw the, the opportunity becoming even clearer, uh, we've we've got a set of eager participants for a second round here. So so um, last thought, I, I, I promise, I, I would say to, to to folks that are contemplating doing this in their own regions. Um, Really, the, the, probably the way to think about this is that it, it's not a one-year process. You, you, you get two rounds of implementation. Uh, and if you think about the notion of, of maybe 20 megawatts of, of, of solar deployment in your region per year uh, for two years or more, right? I mean, the ability to do 40 megawatts of solar and maybe $60 million of, of economic value and, and implementation value per year that's amazing. So let, let me stop talking. Uh, I apologize for running a, a little longer, I think, than I was supposed to, uh, and uh, uh, stand ready to answer questions when we get there. So thank you very much, Mia. Hey, thanks, Blaine. You were right on time. Uh, next, I will turn it over to Jeff King to give us the regional planning organization perspective. Jeff, all yours. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeff King. I'm uh, always eager to hear Blaine talk, uh, truly inspirational. I just uh, can't get enough. Um, my main area of focus here at COG is, is uh, on the development of strategies and initiatives really to address clean energy. Uh, if you can go back to the, the earlier slide there. The, um, uh, <clears throat> to help improve air quality is, is kind of one of our main roles, but also to assist the region in meeting uh, sustainable energy goals. Um, uh, in a photo here on the, f the first page, you can see one of the things that gives me some hope that uh, Solar will continue to be a key strategy in moving to a new energy future. It's the uh, kickoff of the solar decathlon here in DC. I was uh, really pleased to be able to participate 
in that uh, team and, and actually meet the, uh, the, the team that was in from China to do the Solar Decathlon China for 2013 event like this that really um, helped create the type of environment to support the innovative thinking that can help generate some good energy solution. And certainly, I really appreciate the leadership of Blaine and the Optimi team, as well as all the, uh, the sustainability and energy managers and our member agencies here in the COG region. Uh, it's really exciting to see the, the solar projects being considered and hopefully deployed. And uh, just this week, we actually had two really big, important uh, solar announcements. Two of the largest solar arrays in our region actually were just commissioned. So it's uh, really great news, really. Uh, so the next couple of slides, um, <clears throat> I'll just give you a little taste of uh, the COG region. Most of you are probably familiar with it. Um, the, the one thing on this next slide to, to, to note is uh, our three main policy boards, the uh, Air Quality Committee, the Climate, Energy, Environment Policy Committee, the CTC, and the Transportation Planning Board. Uh, the next slide, you can see we're kind of centrally located in the Mid-Atlantic, and we actually helped kick off the uh, Mid-Atlantic Sustainability Collaborative with EPA Region 3 a few years ago. Uh, so we're, we're kind of committed to, to, to trying to make a difference here in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, particularly with all the large metro regions, you know, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Richmond, uh, Hampton Roads, uh, et cetera. Next slide. And so there's a number of uh, things that are really driving our, our region's strong interest in energy solutions. Um, uh, you know, we're really uh, pretty heavily reliant on the electric grid, and we're a you know, big user of natural gas. We have uh, a couple nuclear plants, uh, uh, two fairly large, three actually uh, large coal plants, uh, uh, a bunch of the natural gas plants. So. Um, you know, that, uh, that kind of knowledge that we really are energy uh, dependent and, um, and like many of you, really being driven, you know, the interest in kind of new energy is being driven by some government mandates, uh, state and local leaders and, and the vision they create, as well as the demands of our communities, uh, businesses, citizens, and, 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 and as you've heard, public agencies. Uh, next slide. Uh, COG, uh, COG's climate and energy programs actually sprouted really in uh, the 2007-2008 time frame. The uh, COG Board of Directors directed uh, staff and members to um, pretty much put together a steering committee that le led to the formation of uh, the CEPC, the Climate and Energy Environment Policy Committee. They adopted the climate change report. Uh, the CEPC and, and the, the board really is also supported by some key work groups and committees, the Energy Advisory Committee, the Intergovernmental Green Building Group, IGBG, uh, recently the Integrated Community Energy Task Force, we're about to launch in, a, in the next couple of weeks a conversation with the Department of Defense on kind of clean energy community collabor collaboration. And one of the first acts of, of CEPC was to form a climate and energy action plan in 2010 uh, with goals really for 2012. Uh, next slide. And so you can quickly see the, the targets that were adopted um, by the COG board back in 2008, you know, more or less in line with kind of the Kyoto targets. Um, so there is a kind of a strong commitment in the region to, to you know, achieve these uh, reductions. And clearly, things like solar PV are, are one of the, the things being considered that could help us get there. Next slide. And so to support the, uh, these uh, initiatives, we have um, a variety of things underway, um, you know, behavior change campaign, trying to get folks to, to save energy, a lot of interest in things like microgrids and district energy, electric vehicles, cooperative procurement, uh, you name it, there's there's a, a committee here focused on it one way or the other, and uh, and clearly the solar PV has uh, kind of risen to the top. Uh, it, it's a very strong interest to the CFC chair as, as well as our members, and as Blaine mentioned, uh, fortunately, Kind of our long-standing role as convener really helped uh, get the word out and, and get kind of uh, support and buy-in from from various agencies to participate. Uh, next slide. Uh, and you know, just quickly, as many uh, folks are, we, you know, our, our priorities uh, have tended to be you know, really focusing in on energy efficiency, kind of the the California stacking order. Uh, you know, efficiency first. Uh, really uh, trying to get some focus on how do we reduce emissions from the transportation sector, and there's uh, a big electric vehicle work group that's trying to think through those issues. 
on October, uh, excuse me, on July 30th, we're going to have a big meeting here trying to figure out what it is that Wall Street needs us to do differently to start getting some money flowing for big efficiency or renewables projects. So that should be an interesting conversation. And we're always looking for ways to figure out a way to consolidate, you know, our purchasing power here uh, for renewable energy, green products, you name it, to, to help uh, to move the ball along. <laughs> Next slide. Um, hold on one second. Sorry about that. Um, so I mentioned the 2012 action plan. Uh, you know, just to give you a taste, there's um, you know uh, targets for our members to adopt uh, kind of a regional green building policy. A lot of interest in efficient streetlights. Uh, a target that all of our members try to consume 10% renewable, and, and many, as is, is Blaine can attest, like the District of Columbia and Rockville, Maryland, and others are really uh, doing way beyond 10%, which is great to see. Uh, next slide. And the 2012 plan actually had uh, a number of things that all of our members uh, committed to do. And this slide gives you a sense of that. And, and these initial phases, a lot of it was, you know, come up with, uh, uh, you know, uh, greenhouse gas emissions inventories and, and energy plans, et cetera, and, and most of our governments are, are having success in that. Next slide. And we're, we certainly recognize that not all of our member uh, jurisdictions can, uh, you know, have the same level of resources or interest, so there's kind of a range of things that, uh, that uh, we're hoping uh, folks can, can do. Uh, this slide gives you a sense of that. Next slide. <clears throat> so specific to the solar PV, uh, it was interesting, the, the solar PV target actually was pre-2010 uh, work plan. It, it actually uh, found a home in the 2008 report. And interestingly, the former Secretary of Natural Resources, Preston Bryant from Virginia, um, actually put forth the aspirational goal of 10,000 solar roofs by 2012. And we had some uh, interim goals trying to kind of get things kick-started, so we had 1,000 solar roofs by 2010. And uh, interesting, during the debates uh, about kind of what to put in that initial set of recommendations for the COG board, there was a discussion of whether or not it should be the solar roof target or a megawatt target. <clears throat> and uh, interesting, uh, Harriet Tregoning, the director of the uh, Office of Planning for D.C., kind of came up with the notion that, you know, we should stick with the solar roof because it can help us create a constituency for climate. So it's kind of interesting, uh, interesting discussion. And uh, fortunately, we uh, have a uh, data sharing agreement with utilities, so we have pretty robust data on both energy demand as well as generation. And uh, we did meet our uh, 2010 goal. We actually uh, had a little more than 1,000 solar roofs in 2010. But getting to that 10,000 number by 2012 is, is, is going to be tough. We're going to have to, uh, to really do more. Uh, next slide. Uh, so there's probably a, a number of things that certainly could help us. Uh, one of the, clearly one of the, probably the biggest things that's that's driving this is uh, our our friends in uh, Blaine and EPA, and and I tell you, it really has made a difference. Um, you know, it, he um, the things that Blaine said are, are true. Uh, there's no question that that uh, we would not be seeing the level of interest and commitment to thinking about this and looking at looking hard at this if, if it wasn't for Blaine and, and his uh, enthusiasm and, and leadership. And uh, there's no question that uh, he has chosen a very good partner or firm or consultant, I guess you'd say, contractor and Optony, because they uh, clearly uh, know their stuff when it comes to solar and have been uh, extremely uh, kind of diligent and persistent and uh, strong at kind of continuing to move the ball along. Uh, great. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that um, I personally would like to see a little more of, and, and, and interesting if you go back to the very beginning days of the conversation with Blaine and others, there was the hope at that time that we'd actually have folks like the Department of Defense on board with the collaborative, and, and ultimately that didn't work out. But, um, you know, here in the National Capital Region with our, you know, huge federal presence, it would be great to see what more the federal agencies could do to help us meet our regional uh, targets, so I uh, would be quite interested in that. <clears throat> One of the other things I've become kind of interested in recently is the whole uh, energy assurance planning effort, critical infrastructure. Uh, you know, we just had the big derecho 
event and had a really wreaked havoc on our energy system and uh, already some interesting conversations about you know what can we do differently than diesel gen sets to have a more resilient energy um, you know, energy system and uh, kind of linking those sustainability folks and the energy folks with the actual CIP emergency people uh, could be an interesting way to, 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 to get um, more solar deployed and particularly for critical infrastructure. And one of the other areas I think would be real neat to see is uh, some more community solar and I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, particularly DC Council at some point can get out some legislation to help enable that. So that would be real, real interesting. So next slide. That's it. There's my uh, contact information if you want to learn more and uh, kind of interesting couple of slides there. Pick photos there. The uh, recently took a couple trips to, to China and, and got to say that I saw way more solar uh, deployed in, in Beijing and other places than than here. And, and, I, and I'll tell you, over the last 10 days when we had that incredible heat wave, I was absolutely amazed that we were burning natural gas to create hot water with the, the incredible solar resource that we're really not tapping. So I think Blaine's vision of solar on all the roofs in the mid-Atlantic uh, is good by me. So I uh, really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Next, we will turn it over to Tyler at Octony. Tyler, all yours. Great. Thanks, Mia. And thanks to Jeff and Blaine for setting the stage here and for your support on these um, on these projects. Uh, um, Optin is a quick background at solar advisory services across the entire life cycle of solar projects to government, schools, and commercial entities in the U.S. and in China. Next slide. And today I'm going to talk about the details of the collaborative procurement model for solar PV projects that we've constructed and provide an overview of how it works and how it has evolved into a successful example. Next slide. And so I wanted to start off by acknowledging that uh, local governments have really shown great leadership over uh, the past several years uh, with regard to renewable energy. And uh, in the absence of national and international consensus in terms of buying renewable energy and greenhouse gas reduction targets, um, local governments have really stepped up and are incorporating uh, these policies into their strategic plans, uh, as, as Jeff mentioned. And it's happening all over the country. And they're doing this because their constituents want it, uh, but also because solar makes sense. Solar saves money by decreasing operating costs, uh, it stim stimulates job creation and economic development, and it localizes the environmental and social benefits. And new finance models have emerged to help governments tap into the tax-related benefits and have helped solar to become the most widely adopted distributed source of renewable power. And it's not just governments. Businesses are also going solar to decrease their operating costs and hedge against uh, energy price increases. And Walmart and Ikea are a couple of notable uh, companies that are, are doing it in the major uh, But challenges still remain. Uh, budget constraints, of course, uh, require new innovative and cost-effective solutions for finding, developing, and financing viable renewable energy projects. Um, managing this, the solar procurement process is definitely time consuming and uh, requires up-to-date technology and financing expertise as the industry is uh, evolving quickly. And the public-driven need to demonstrate leadership and promote economic development and job creation creates pressure uh, to move quickly. And few firms have the expertise the experience and the independence to support the entire solar life cycle from feasibility studies to procurement management and uh, project commissioning. Next slide. And so those challenges uh, reinforce the need for the collaborative procurement model. And this pioneering approach uses an innovative and proven collaborative framework of best practices from dozens of prior projects. And it's supporting deploying a step-by-step -step opt-in process, which includes evaluating sites for technical and economic feasibility, um, drafting and managing RFP, in-depth proposal evaluation, and comprehensive negotiation support for the jurisdiction. 
Uh, and one of the primary success factors of the model is the enabling role that the convening organization plays here in bringing all of the different stakeholders together, whether it's the agencies that are participating in the process or those that are looking at, at future rounds, as Blaine mentioned. And so includes agencies or cities and counties, uh, the community, and broadly any other players related to the private sector, such as solar integrators, power purchase agreement providers, and others. And at the heart of the model, you have a lead agency and X number of other participants, and they're really the ones that drive the projects forward. And they're ultimately the buyers and users of solar power and the ones that will, in the end, uh, help to make sure that regional and national uh, goals are achieved. And supporting this on the bottom of the chart, you'll see is, of course, the private sector. And whether it's the integrators, technology providers, PPA, uh, PPA investors, or, of course, the supporting uh, services where a lot of the jobs are, uh, are created. And so really, the model is really orchestrated with all the stakeholders across the different phases um, of implementation to ensure project success. Uh, next slide. And so now let's take a model from a strategic perspective. And you start with a thorough review of the individual site characteristics. And what we're looking for here is uh, the type of facility, uh, potential sizing issues, opportunities for different types of installations, uh, specific sites, and other characteristics that might influence uh, how they can be brought together. And additionally, you want to look at site-specific things such as energy usage, but then more broadly at the agency level regarding contracting requirements and procurement processes, which can be different, uh, of course, when you get together a lot of different uh, jurisdictions and agencies. And with so many sites and participants, it's very important to strategically group or bundle the sites uh, rather than lump them all together, which has proven to be unsuccessful. And you want to group them by uh, installation type. So, you know, is it a, a rooftop? Is it a ground mount? Is it a carport system? Uh, are there multiple opportunities at a single site? And then as for the host facility, uh, are there unique characteristics in terms of size, type of use, location, uh, things of that sort? And then ultimately, what you want to make sure of is that the bundles are attractive to qualified system integrators because that's really the gap that we're uh, trying to bridge here in a market that really does want to provide these services at a competitive price and the availability of those sites. And in the end, each bundle, uh, it, you know, of course, has to be economically beneficial to both the integrators and the buyers for uh, for projects to move forward successfully. And you don't want a bundle that's either too small, which means that there won't be economies of scale or there may not be a significant level of interest from the larger players. Uh, and then you don't want it to be too big, which might discourage some bidders because if it's an all or nothing award, uh, there might be a lot of upfront investment of time without ultimately getting the possibility of any work out of that. And another major benefit of the, the collaborative model is the ability to issue one streamlined RS, uh, RFP. There's a significant amount of savings and of time and effort here. And while the RFP is done as a group, the contracts between the solar integrators and customers are executed on an individual basis. So you have group pricing, but not individual contracts. And uh, stakeholders evaluate the proposals with the guidance of a, an independent expert solar advisor that has no interest in any part of the supply chain but knows it well and really uh, takes the interests of all participants um, and puts them front and center. Next slide. And so the, the benefits of buying in bulk are, are no secret. Been around for millennia, but uh, solar project aggregation has uh, definitely proven to yield greater market interest 
and better pricing by leveraging the group's purchasing power for uh, to get those volume discounts. And we've seen that come in in the 10 to 15 percent range. And by leveraging the group's negotiating power, uh, better terms and conditions uh, are obtained that are favorable uh, to the consumer. And uh, buying in bulk also decreases transaction costs and administrative ta staff time by anywhere from 50 to 75 percent. And that comes from the use of standardized documents uh, such as MOUs, RFPs, uh, power purchase agreements, etc. And then, of course, also the uh, streamlined evaluation and negotiation of the pricing and uh, terms and conditions. And uh, another major benefit is that it provides a way for smaller agencies and sites to participate, which previously was not a cost-effective op option for those folks. And by going through this all together, the seat learning curve is shortened for the entire group, and all benefits are uh, maximized locally. Next slide. And so I'll quickly uh, go over uh, several case studies here um, to show the successes in implementation. And it really starts off in Silicon Valley, um, which is still the largest effort to date. Um, nine jurisdictions came together with 70 sites and implemented 14.4 um, megawatts uh, of solar. And this is being challenged by the um, Washington, D.C. area initiative. Uh, the convening organization here was uh, Joint Venture and the lead agency, uh, Santa Clara County. And there was a good mix of ground mount, rooftop, and carport systems in, in this initiative. And it really proved that the aggregated procurement model does, in fact, yield volume discounts. It lowers administrative and transaction costs and attracts highly qualified vendors and lowers uh, the project risk. Next slide. And this is a, from round one of the Silicon Valley again, and a couple of photos uh, from Santa Clara County. That you have a groundbreaking event with some of the local stakeholders there, and then a photo of uh, construction in action. And this was at the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office, um, building a solar carport nearly for uh, one megawatt. Next slide. Next slide. And the next slide here is uh, an artist rendition of uh, an interesting project that, you know, you're starting to see more and more solar carports, but not uh, in this setting. So this was a, uh, an interesting um, tweak of what we've, we've seen. And this is uh, solar canopies covering uh, bus depots uh, for just over a megawatt uh, for the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority. Next slide. And because of the success, um, uh, we are now in uh, implementation of round two in the Bay Area. And so it's expanded from Silicon Valley to include the East Bay. And, uh, and the scope is, is being expanded um, uh, geographically and uh, in terms of capacity. And so this, this initiative is a, a four-county effort, um, again, with joint venture, but this time led by Alameda County. And the Contra Costa Economic Partnership is in there as well. And it's expected to be two to three times larger than round one and, uh, and was launched uh, late last year. Next slide, please. And then shifting gears to the East Coast, um, Blaine uh, already talked about this. Uh, so I'll just raise a couple of additional uh, points. Uh, but this is really the first multi agency effort to cross state lines, which is uh, very exciting because, you know, if you're on the East Coast, you have a lot smaller states, and so if you're going for a regional uh, initiative, you're going to have to cross state lines, and you, of course, have additional things to deal with, like different uh, policies, but uh, this is uh, the most important part here, I think, is what we've done is demonstrate that this model can be successfully implemented, implemented outside of uh, Silicon Valley in California. Then an interesting twist is uh, the participants are going to be using the Mid-Atlantic SREC market to drive down the electricity prices for these projects. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, uh, huge help um, from the EPA's Green Power Partnership and the support of um, 
the Metropolitan Washington Cobb who have played a, the critical role to, of being the convener and bringing all of the um, participants together here. Uh, next slide. And then uh, for a final case study, um, quickly, this is uh, the Seed Sun Project, which was launched by the California Solar Initiative. And it's yet another example of uh, the model on a regional scale. Um, the innovative twist for this one is that it involves a revolving sun, which helps to reduce upfront costs for the uh, participants. And so that goes to pay for things such as site evaluation and procurement management services, which um, interested participants may not be able to provide up front. And this project has really exciting potential and is uh, just now getting underway. Thank you. And so I just want to uh, sum up here uh, with this map, and it is to say that uh, collaborative purchasing is not just happening in the San Francisco Bay Area and uh, the greater Washington area. Uh, it's happening, uh, solar group purchasing is happening across the country uh, at public and private organizations and at the commercial and residential scale. And it's uh, really the local and regional governments and community organizations that are playing a critical role in enabling solar power communities to flourish across the country. Next slide. And this is the best practices guide that Optini co-authored with the World Resources Institute and uh, Joint Venture. And uh, there's a link there at the bottom of the screen where you can go to download it. And so thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you so much, Tyler. Um, just as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please do so by selecting the raise your hand button, the little hand looking like a high five on your control panel, or by typing a question into the questions box. And we actually already have several questions, so I will unmute all of our speakers. And the first question is, how is COG tracking the number of PV roofs and PV installations? Um, as I mentioned, the um, a few years back, uh, as part of the whole CPC effort, uh, there was kind of a commitment to do an annual progress report. So uh, all of our member jurisdictions receive kind of a survey, and they send that in, and we staff here kind of creates a nice little report that, to really focus in on the successes and progress we're making. As part of that, we also had our uh, kind of electric senior elected official on that group send a letter to the, uh, I guess, the heads of the utilities in our region. We were served by uh, BG&E, Constellation, Pepco, Dominion, uh, and I guess the old Allegheny uh, group. And uh, they all agreed. So every uh, year, first quarter, we get a report from utilities that gives us electricity consumption by sector, by zip code, or jurisdiction. And they also report to us the total number of grid interconnected solar. And um, yeah, so we have that for, I guess, calendar year 2009, 2010. I think we're just now finishing up the analysis on 2011. So it's been real nice to have that partnership with utilities. And, and uh, it's been fairly straightforward and easy, at least on our end, to deal with them. I'm not quite sure of the process they use on their end. I, I think it you know, involves some interesting database queries and the like. But that's how we do it. The, the, the harder challenge for us, and, uh, and we'll be bugging Blaine about that, is how do we help our members get green power purchase information, because that's a little bit different, but um, we're working on it. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Our next question is, our local utility provider has been reluctant to support PV in downtown Syracuse because of safety concerns about interconnection to the localized downtown grid or spot network. Have the DC area utilities raised concerns about adding close to 20 megawatts of PV in a short amount of time? Um, well, you know, it's interesting. I, um, this is Jeff. The, the utilities, um, I guess, have some, some different uh, 
different views on, on solar PV. Uh, as, as Blaine alluded to, the tri-state, and in particular Virginia, is a you know, regulated state, and, and Dominion really has, uh, doesn't have currently a, a strong kind of appetite for solar, although they don't seem, you know, they don't really prevent interconnection. They're certainly interested in it. The way Dominion, at least, has sold this concept, not, not the collaborative purchase, but the whole issue of solar to the State Corporation Commission is, you know, they put forth a number of programs that basically say, look, we need to test out solar, particularly on heavily loaded circuits, and so can we get permission from the SEC to do these kind of pilots and, you know, commercial scale. Uh, that kind of thing. The thing I've heard kind of generally from the utilities when you're talking about a you know a small solar roof, you know residential or something, it's not a, a real big concern. But um, yeah, if you start putting on you know a sizable uh, system that creates some kind of voltage issue or you know intermittency issue, um, you know I think that they'd be a little concerned about it. But I, I don't think in the case of these systems we've we've actually engaged yet fully with with the utility on, you know, engineering approvals, as it were. We did have a very good conversation with Dominion, and they're, they're, they're interested in our project mix, particularly as it relates to potentially to their proposed SCC programs and whether or not any of our sites can kind of get rolled into their, their, their initiative. This, this is plain, you know, the thing I would add to that, um, it, it, we, we've seen, seen the, the issue that the Syracuse question captures in a couple other places, and if, if it, it seems uh, uh, like coming to, to a utility with this kind of approach might actually be, be more compelling for them, because you know, here at utility, here's a whole bunch of your customers. It's not just a couple of systems that are maybe gonna, gonna trip your concern wire. It's, it's actually there's a meaningful slug of, of implementation possibility uh, and economic development activity, and, and in fact, some uh, additional benefits the slug is meaningful enough that we talk about peak load shaving and all the rest of it. It is, in fact, worth your time uh, to engage with this set of your core stakeholders uh, who want to do something uh, to figure out a, a solution together, right? Because the, the, the payoff is actually, is actually worth the effort of, of figuring out what that solution is. Great. I think we have time for one last quick question. Have any of the collaborative parking efforts been able to finance solar without state, ESREC, or other incentives other than the federal ITC? Yeah, Tyler, you um, wanna? <laughs> yeah, I think that one's uh, directed at me. Um, you know, th that's the ultimate goal here is to find ways to finance solar um, without any incentive, you know, and that includes the ITC. That's eventually where uh, the industry needs to go and uh, is going and, and we'll get there. And uh, in California, um, a lot of the, uh, th there is no renewable energy, there's not a significant renewable energy uh, credit market out there. So, you know, here on the East Coast, you have the SREC market, which is uh, fairly strong. It doesn't uh, exist at a significant level since that has gone away, which was, uh, uh, it's, I guess, in the midst of uh, petering out, but it was structured in a way that the, the large incentives were up front, and they kind of stepped down with the increasing amounts of capacity that were brought online, so the lower steps uh, didn't really add a lot of value. And so we're there in California, and different you know, there are a lot a lot of different markets across the country, um, but here in the greater Washington area, we will be relying on the SREC uh, market, but, you know, that's just for the first uh, three years or, or five years because those contracts um, are actually quite um, short-term in nature compared to the uh, longevity of the solar PV system. So um, to summarize, uh, there, California and in other parts of the country, um, I think with innovative models such as this, um, we're not far behind. Great, thank you. 
In an effort to not take up everyone's afternoon, I'm going to cut off the questions there. But when we send off the presentations later on this afternoon or tomorrow, the contact information for all of our speakers will be there, and you can email them the rest of your questions. I just wanted to briefly touch on some additional resources that we have. Um, the Department of Energy's Solar Powering Your Community Guidebook is a fantastic resource and has a section on a guide to group purchasing. It's aimed at local government. Next, NARC just recently created their Profiles in Regional Solar Planning, a handbook and resource guide. This is aimed at helping regional planning organizations um, put solar in their regions and features a case study on the Metro DC Clean Energy Collaborative Procurement Initiative that we touched on today, as well as a toolkit giving you a step-by-step -step guide on how you can do collaborative procurement in your region. You can find that handbook on our website, which also features some other information about the partnership, upcoming events, solar podcasts, and more. NREL also released a guide of community shared solar, which talks about state policies, tax policies, and other instances, and some practical tools for getting started. You can find it there on that link or on their website. Uh, in addition, they also released their Solarized Guidebook, which is more of a community guide looking at major market barriers um, and establishing a strong solar installation economy. Oh. Thank you very much to Blaine, Tyler, and Jeff, and to all of our attendees. Um, I said the PDF version will be sent out within the next 24 hours. Uh, thank you for your attendance, and we look forward to your participation in future webinars. Muted. The organizer.